Well, it's, it's great to be here with all of you. And, and first of all, I'm thrilled to see so many colleagues here. I think seeing some of the groups that you represent, I think we've got certainly some incredibly influential groups, some incredibly innovative groups. And I think one of the things that gives me great hope in any program like this is the old uh, maxim that you know, none of us are as smart as all of us. Uh, and, and so as we go through, I'm going to sprinkle it with a few examples that I think apply to some of the work that uh, you are all doing. So lucky for you, before the break, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about focusing. I'm going to talk about specific things uh, that we all can do together. And then some of the resources that the uh, Medical Association, the Hospital Association, and, and the Alliance are going to be sharing uh, with those of you that uh, would like to work with us on this. So first of all, you know, as you've heard uh, uh, twice, uh, Choosing Wisely has been a physician-led effort to identify non-value-added services. Uh, and I, again, want to uh, point out that this is in the context of our efforts to really make sure that those services that have an evidence basis that patients benefit from, we continue to work hard to promote. So one of the programs the Alliance has, for example, is uh, the, the community checkup now going into its seventh version, which identifies opportunities for improving our cancer screening, improving our diabetes care, et cetera. So this is an example of the converse, where we really want to work together to identify services that we need to really uh, try and do less of. And the number I had, where I think we're, we've got a range at least, but the number that I was given is somewhere around 290 to 300 recommendations uh, from the participating specialty groups, which is impressive. Um, and I do know, and even when I get down to the few I'll talk about and and that we're going to recommend focusing on, that we are going to be getting blowback. We're going to hear about it from our, our colleagues. We're going to hear about it from our societies. But that said, I think really being able to share the evidence and having the strength of, or, you know, our, our organized colleagues behind us, I think, will help a lot. And in, in the, the group that I'm going to share with you in just uh, the next slide would point out that this actually uh, came out of a really uh, thoughtful discussion of a group of medical directors that was con uh, convened both by the medical and hospital associations where they discussed, well, we've got lots of things we could focus on. Where do we see the most, you know, most opportunity? Where would we like to start? Uh, and so out of that, uh, we, we then took it to the Alliance Quality Improvement Committee where we reviewed the evidence uh, basis for each of them and basically said, we think these are great ideas. Uh, we recommend supporting them as well. And so I think that in choosing the, the, the groups or I think what somebody has referred to as our buckets of recommendations, I think there's been a lot of thoughtful vetting uh, to get there. So in looking at the uh, magic number five uh, that we're choosing, and, I, and we did cheat a bit because we sort of combined a few. Um, we've got, I think, some areas uh, that, that are going to make a significant impact. And the first one, as I think uh, uh, was alluded to earlier, was on uh, cervical cancer screening. And one of my uh, uh, colleagues at Group Health, who I will not name, who sits on the QI committee, refers to this problem as overpopulation. And the idea there is, you know, it is, uh, it is almost, for doctors and patients, it's almost like putting on a seatbelt. It becomes such a habit that uh, you literally have, uh, you know, women as, as they're, they're getting older, in fact, well, as they're getting older, say, can't we keep doing this? Because they're just, it's just become so ingrained. And in my colleagues, I've seen them do it for women that have had hysterectomies, and they'll go through sort of the whys. But you listen to this in almost, you know, in astonishment. And so a lot of this is really breaking, you know, years of habit and really relying heavily on the evidence. Another powerful area uh, is early elective deliveries. And this is another one where it's, uh, I would say, kind of complicity between patients and providers that, uh, you know, often they'll say, well, I'm going, you know, well, there are lots of reasons that this is done. Uh, part of it may be your schedule. but. What was so impressive is in a recent effort when we uh, shared data on uh, you know, the, the variation of what systems were doing around elective uh, early uh, deliveries, that the numbers were so powerful that, that we had two groups, when they looked at this, said, we didn't know this was happening. And literally uh, took it back within a month and chatted about it with their OBGYNs who, uh, and put in some very simple steps. And we saw a dramatic turnaround. And, and this is not a minor deal. Uh, the, the impact on uh, the baby, especially for early elective deliveries, uh, is, is significant. Uh, the overuse of antibiotics, I don't have to tell you about this one. We've talked about sinus infections, but 
you know, thinking about moms with kids with, uh, you know, painful ears, uh, sore throats, uh, and, and one of the keys here is discussion. It's not enough to say the evidence doesn't support this, I'm not going to do it. You really have to, one, you know, many of us are parents, so we have to sort of put ourselves in our patient's shoes and really talk to them about what we're recommending is actually better for your child or better for you and why. And it takes more time. So there is the investment that we have to put in about talking about things uh, because often it's just quicker to say, sure, here, here's the script. When, when in fact the, the important thing to do is really to discuss options and, and to spend time with that. Overuse of cardiac imaging, uh, you know, we, you know, many folks have gotten into the habit of doing EKGs and stress testing in very low risk uh, situations. Uh, you know, for example, some patients getting ready for surgery or some patients coming in and saying, I had a buddy at work that had a heart attack and I want to get checked. Uh, and so this is an area that, that again, holds very little value and uh, great potential costs. And the one that I, I will admit is a grab bag, is the overuse of imaging. Um, but uh, again, incredibly powerful. Uh, uh, there is not a person in this room that has not had a patient walk in and say, my back hurts, I want an MRI. And, uh, you know, and, and not only that, but they've had a friend tell them, you better ask for an MRI, because you know, they'll have a story about a friend that didn't get one, and this is what happened. So just like you know, Bill was talking about, uh, we all have our uh, anecdotal stories. Our patients do too. And so we really have to be ready to explain why uh, we don't do certain things at a certain time. And uh, I think, for example, Virginia Mason has been a great local example of the work they've done around back pain. Uh, and following on their example, one thing we've done in our neighborhood clinics is, you know, if a patient comes in and they don't have red flags, we don't do imaging. And that includes, you know, plain films as, red as, red, as well as MRIs. But then, when we're ready to refer on, we refer to a physiatrist rather than a surgeon. And, and really, it leads to better outcomes. But it really means we have to explain why, because many patients come in and they really want it. Same thing for headaches. Many patients that come in, you know, they're absolutely convinced that they've got a brain tumor. And so part of it is to explain you know, why the, the likelihood of that is very low, why you really, in fact, what I'll often do is saying, can you tell me what you think you have? And not uncommon, I'd say in a third of cases, they say, I think I got a brain tumor. And so really saying, well, let's go through how we look for that. And so again, it's the discussion part of this that's so important when we work with patients. Uh, in terms of some of the specifics, uh, how we'll, we'll do it, uh, again, uh, uh, David did a great job of going through some of the really key uh, operational steps uh, towards implementation. Uh, I'll point out that the first thing we have to do is education and training which I think all of us know is uh, necessary but not sufficient. Uh, you know, we train ourselves to we're blue in the face, uh, but uh, unless you actually make system changes that embed what you want to happen, uh, things really don't move uh, ahead very well. And so uh, the area where I think we have a rich opportunity together is to look at workflows and changes in our systems that really support the goals that we're working towards. Uh, and these will include, you know, things around behavior, education, uh, and, and how we want to do this. And then feedback, which is incredibly potent. Uh, there is no group of uh, people more competitive than physicians. And if you, you want to see a change in behavior, uh, get a metric that matters, put names next to it, and post it in the room and or post it online and you will see, you know, first, well, first you're going to get people that are upset coming to talk to you about the bad data. But after that, you then get to have the conversation about, you know, this is, this is what you can, uh, you can do to improve. So on the measurement status, you know, one of the things that, again, the Alliance and others will work on will be external metrics, but um, that'll take a little time. Uh, but I think we're going to be able to see some changes in some of the, the reports that we're having. So I'd like to encourage all of you in your systems to take a look at, you know, for each of these areas, are there one or two metrics that you feel are solid that you can develop for more immediate feedback? Uh, that frankly, uh, you know, having data that comes out once a year really doesn't change things very fast. You know, quarterly would be good. Uh, you can decide if you want to do it more frequently than that. But the big thing there is the feedback loop to providers is, is one of the most powerful ways we support change. And frankly, you know, we were talking about what the, what the business case is. I think as we look towards where we're heading in medicine with accountable care, uh, we're not only going to be looked at for what we do around cost, we're really going to be scrutinized on outcomes. 
we're really going to get scrutinized on quality. So to the extent that we follow what the recommendations are, the evidence you know, basis is, you know, it's a win-win-win. You know? And so uh, this is going to be incredibly important. So first of all, one of the concrete things that is being recommended is we're going to have a local Choosing Wisely task force. And I would really like to invite all of you to consider participating. Uh, I think, uh, again, first of all, we need you because you're the ones that are going to come up with many of the ideas that we'll want to share. Uh, but frankly, you also get to hear what other groups are up to, which is, frankly, uh, the fastest way we all learn. So we're going to be sharing strategies. We're going to be learning, uh, as David pointed out, from national experts. Um, and we'll be, you'll be helping us uh, shape how we communicate the Choosing Wisely uh, results and, and uh, where we're going with this, because this will be an evolving uh, opportunity and, and program. And so here is uh, Teresa's email. Is this your home email or your work email, Teresa? OK, good. So she would be our contact person for those that are interested in hearing more. And uh, as you've seen before, we've got uh, these are some additional materials. Again, we've got no shortage of training materials. What we need are the system change ideas and the workaround metrics. But you know, here you've got this. And so the next steps would be uh, consider joining the task force. We'd love to have you. And then think about, again, as we're all preparing for accountable care, how this might fit into your activities uh, at your organization. And then to you know, identify what you're going to work on, how you're going to track your, your progress. And then, again, we would love it if you share practices. Your, your ideas may be so good, you're going to keep it under wraps. But we would really love it if you would share, because that's how we make the, the greatest impact. And then, of course, I think uh, we're going to need to celebrate together. And then, before I uh, let you all loose, I, I did want to share one thing I thought of as I was thinking about this, because you know, it's, medicine doesn't change very quickly or easily. I mean, occasionally does, but not very often. And the thing I was most struck with uh, was remembering back uh, to when I was an intern. In fact, I just saw uh, Dr. Curtis, who he and I were interns together, uh, and Dr. Klarfeld, who was my uh, surgical resident when I was an intern. So no stories, please. But back in, as I say, back in the day, uh, the norm was everybody got a full coat. You know, didn't matter your age, didn't matter, you know, what you wanted, you got it. And so watching what happened in, in just the few years after I got into practice around the discussion of code, no code. And granted, we have a long way to go. But when you see how far we've come in terms of considering what patients, what's best for patients and what they want, uh, that was a huge sea change. And I really think that in looking at this program here, even though it feels a bit daunting, uh, with this focus and with your help, I think it's going to be a rip-roaring success. All right, well, everybody enjoy your break, and we'll come back for the second session.